So let me introduce the first uh, speaker, which is Alison Beach. As I said, she's from After 18. She's actually the manager of After 18, After 18 which is a charity based in Leicester for unaccompanied young people uh, living in Leicester, UK, supporting them in their transition to adulthood. So, please. <laughs> Hello, um, thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to speak and speak first. So, um, yeah. um, I'm very pleased to see so many familiar faces that are well known to our team here. Um, but for those of you that don't know me, that I'm the manager. Um, and After 18 is a charity that supports refugees under 25 and particularly on a company to asylum seeking children, but we continue to support them right up to um, adult under 25. We're particularly interested in the education of young people um, and each week we see about up to 40 young people at our drop-ins. And today I just wanted to share our experience of supporting young people on their journey to higher education. After the need to be safe, getting a good e education is the next biggest priority for young people on being in the UK. Many aspire to go to university, a lot have the ability, but comparat comparatively few get that far. We will hear later, I'm sure, about the great work that's been done at our universities and campaigns to support refugees into higher education. However, in our experience, the barriers to higher education start not at the university gate, but go right back to when a young person arrives in the UK. Firstly, if I can just give you a bit of context about um, how our organisation evolved in relation to education. When After 18 started, almost six years ago now, um, it was just a helpline aimed at helping young people stay engaged with services when they transition to adulthood. There were a couple of referrals from colleagues, um, social services and other organisations who were working with young asylum seekers who had been offered a place at university but were unable to accept them because they were not considered home students and therefore the fees were prohibited. We supported them to apply for, um, for Article 26 um, scholarships successfully and they made their way onto university um, and one of them has now just completed his Masters. However, the word spread um, and we applied for and received some funding for Comet Relief to develop our education work. And in doing so, it became clear to us that going to university was one of the highest rungs on the education ladder but there were many lower rungs below it that were missing or not secure for young people to be able to climb to that position. Once asylum seeking students are able to get a place at university, I actually breathe a sigh of relief because there's quite a lot of support um, available to them. Um, and I've certainly seen an increase in the amount of support and awareness and understanding in the higher education sector in the past five years that I've been doing this job. So, what are the major barriers in preventing young asylum seekers, refugees, or those with temporary or discretionary leave from getting a place at the university? Because this is quite a short presentation, I'm going to kick back start and have five main points. Okay, the first point is the starting point. Um, our young people are generally arriving in the UK age 16 or older, at a point when their first <coughs> year will be taking exams based on their previous 12 years of study. This puts young refugees at a significant disadvantage in progressing towards university. While most asylum seekers will need to work on their English, it would be a mistake to think that all young people are at the same starting point. Some have received a formal education, while others write up past secondary school, while others have never set foot in a classroom before and cannot read and write in their own language. Obviously, they have very different needs to be able to um, progress. Others may have passed through various countries and education systems and teaching may not have been in their first language or it may have been taught in multiple languages along the way. For those who have never been to school before, to be suddenly placed in a college environment, pen in hand, possibly with European students who have received many years of education in their own language, can really dent their confidence and um, hinder their progression to learning, especially if the teachers are not sensitive to their background. We have also noted that some students are fleeing countries with dictatorships, where questioning and thinking widely is not encouraged in education, and this has left them with a the perception that learning can only take place when they are writing down what the teacher is saying and memorising it. We've had to work with some students around self-study skills, the purpose of homework and the importance of critical thinking. The second reason is qualifications. Many of the students we work with have completed qualifications before leaving. However, they often find that their secondary school's their certificates are not equivalent to the qualifications accepted for university access. This means that they need to complete further study to meet the criteria. This could mean doing an A-level or equivalent for two years, although in our experience, they would probably be asked to do GCSE English at least first. 
Adding years onto their study time at this point is really demoralising for students who are expecting to start university. They'll be covering old ground and will just be starting university when their peers are finishing. This leaves them feeling that they're not progressing as they should in life and um, vulnerable to um, uh, low mental health. Students may have also have fled without their qualifications and have difficulty proving their previous study. So have to repeat some of it in order to have proof of their level in order to progress. And for a handful of our oldest students, there has been some problematic issues around not having evidence of their previous university study um, to, to prove that they can get on here, but at the same time that being considered within the student finance system, so not being able to access um, student finance to get to university. And this can significantly, significantly impact their careers. The third reason is the offer. There seems to me to be an assumption, at least in Leicester, that those who are capable will have done their GCSEs at school. And so there's little need for English and Maths beyond our GCSE beyond that. There's pretty much no second chance for students who miss out on a school education to acquire extra subjects. An example of this is a new arrival who needs to do physics um, to progress to A-level, which is a requirement for the course she wants to do at university. But it's not offered anywhere that we can find in Leicester post school. We've also noted a shrinkage in the offer in Leicester, as all the FE colleges have merged into one super college, and two out of the three sixth forms have just merged. This means that if a college doesn't offer a subject or the student is unsatisfied, there is very little alternative options for them. The there are alternatives to A levels such as BTEC, but in our experience, it has left students with reduced offers from universities that will accept them, and those that have gone on to university have struggled as they were less prepared for the academic rigour of university study. So our students are at a disadvantage in competing for places at university because they've not had the opportunity for the foundation skills, and it's very difficult to catch up on those opportunities if they've missed out from school in sixth form. I should also say that this term we've seen a, a bigger increase in the number of neat school children that have not been able to access a place. It's quite a shortage of school places across the city at the moment as well. Point number four, funding. The funding criteria for further education seem very complex and seem to shift around a bit. While students are under, are under 90, they can get free education, but after that it becomes much more complex depending on status and circumstances. We have known adult asylum seekers be charged for ESOL and access courses, which is not affordable to them. For those under 21 and estranged from their families, they should be allowed to complete their education while on benefits, but those over 21 should be expected to work. And for the small number of uh, young people that we have within families, this has an impact as well. If they are working, income might be taken into consideration for charging, and if they're on job seekers, they have to be available for work, which means that they can't always concentrate on the studies. Students are very much in a race against time to get all the qualifications they need to be able to go to university before they age out. Um, final point is the hostile environment. This year we saw a change to the Immigration Act and with the introduction of the Immigration Bill in which some cases um, introduced a, a no study condition for some cases of our students. This has present, prevented a number of them this year from doing um, the courses that they would have liked to have done as doing so would have constituted a criminal offence. Fortunately we managed to get this removed from all cases um, and there has been new guidance issued in the hope that this will be just used as a last resort from now on. But what we have, but what this has introduced is the concept that um, education can be criminalised in this way. And it is punishable with a prison sentence as well. It's not impossible for young people to succeed and to go to university. And we have had young people that have gone on to be very successful. But they need a huge amount of personal tenacity to do so. Um, they need support, understanding, and most importantly, opportunities. If you want to find out more about our work, then please have a look at our website. Um, and if you are just a quick plug, if you're looking for any Christmas cards, every year we produce Christmas cards alongside the young people. And this money goes directly to support the projects that we, we do. So have a look at the table. There are leaflets. There are leaflets. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.